Welcome to the Vanderbilt Philosophy Faculty Interviews. I'm here with Professor Michael Hodges, a specialist in philosophy of language. True. Analytic philosophy. That's for sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm so far, I'm batting pretty well. Uh, Wittgenstein. That too. He even wrote a book on that guy. Two. <laughs> two. Uh, philosophy of religion. I like that. And American philosophy. Exciting. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, you did your uh, bachelor's degree in philosophy at William & Mary. I did. Uh, you went to the University of Virginia for your doctorate. That's right. And then afterwards, you taught for a short period of time at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. I apologize. For that. That's exactly it. It's a little too orange over there. <laughs> Happily, you came here to Nashville to teach at Vanderbilt after that short stint there. And uh, you are now a professor, a full professor of philosophy here at Vanderbilt. I am that. Um, so, Professor Hodges. Sir. How'd you get into philosophy? Well, I was thinking about that. Uh, there's there's a, a scholarly story and then there's the, <coughs> the life story. Both, when, please. Okay, when I went <laughs> to, to William and Mary, my first semester, which was... My, my sophomore year, because I went a year to, at a Baptist Bible school. That wasn't part of the story. No, <laughs> was it wasn't story, yeah. part of the story. I tried <laughs> to keep that secret. Uh, anyway, uh, I had a, a, my first semester, I had a class that met on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. The class was a, a colonial um, European history uh, and there was a pop quiz every Saturday morning. That got to be a pain. And so the second semester, I swore that I wouldn't take any classes on Saturday. And philosophy, which I'd taken the first semester and enjoyed and done pretty well in, met on Tuesdays and Thursdays with a quiz section at some other time. So I took Tuesday, Thursday. That way I couldn't have any Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday classes. Uh, at that time, and then I got my quiz section at another time and went on with my study of philosophy. So the irony is that the, the philosophy, uh, at the very least in the Greek story, is that it was started in symposia, which was a sort of a drinking circumstance. So the irony is that it was that you had already sort of started on that on that trajectory then. The drinking sort. Well, well, I, well. If Saturday morning was a uh, was a was a problem, was it just because of the fact that you just didn't want, want to be you didn't want to miss the cartoons? Is that the? I did. I, I did not <laughs> want to have a quiz section every single uh, a, a, a pop quiz every Saturday. And the guy that ga that gave the course in British Empire uh, had a quiz every Saturday morning. Uh, it was not a pop quiz because everybody knew it was going to be a quiz. So no, it's not. It's not a pop quiz if you're not, if it's not a surprise. That well, that's the surprise test paradox. That, it's true know. as it, it works that's back. Right. That's right. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to avoid that, and philosophy met on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and uh, uh, and then I got a section maybe Thursday afternoon or something like that, and uh, in the meantime I got invited to join what they call the sophomore seminar which was a, an eclectic collection of readings uh, that met uh, in the evening, one day a week. And uh, we read stuff like uh, Freud's The Future of an Illusion and uh, uh, Goldwater's The Conscience of a Conservative. I mean, it was an odd duck collection of things that uh, uh, we talked about. And uh, that made That's it. a real liberal arts uh, experience then. That was, that was. I remember that with great fondness. Uh, you got to take seriously certain things and develop a way of thinking about them. So, so, uh, so we have, so is there a, so we, we were promised two stories. So that was one story. Oh, well, the other yeah. story was I was always, without knowing it, I was always interested in things philosophical. Uh, you know, I, my mind just drifted toward that stuff. I, I like to read Plato's dialogues, found them fascinating both at a personal level, particularly the early dialogues, and, uh, and at a, a philosophical level, I guess. So I was kind of ready to do that, but the immediate, the immediate cause was uh, avoiding Saturday classes. <laughs> That's it. 
Life's funny that way with these sort of uh, intersections of, and th I guess this is a fortuitous intersection of avoiding one thing and happily hopping into another thing. Well, uh, well you, you know what uh, you know what uh, Kierkegaard says: you you live forward and understand, understand backwards. backwards. And, and so it may be that because I went on in philosophy, I now remember distinctly that as a turning point moment, uh, and I sort of connect up the narrative. I, I'm not sure, because I don't know how I would be sure, but anyway, that's the story I tell myself. Well, it's a good story. Um, and one of the later developments of that story is your, um, uh, your focused work in the pragmatist tradition, and particularly with... Um, with a philosopher by the name of Ludwig Wittgenstein. Yeah, he's no uh, pragmatist. Well, he's no pragmatist then. Right. Uh, so that's uh, itself a sort of a clarifying point then. Uh, so tell me, tell us about your work in these sort of two, we'll say, uh, we'll say parallel traditions then. Yeah, the, I think they do overlap in some important ways. And I've written some, some papers that uh, go that way. But <clears throat> I got interested in um, uh, the pragmatists or the American tradition. Uh, uh, early on, I wrote an honors thesis in, uh, uh, at William and Mary uh, on ethics, uh, where I uh, developed uh, some of Santayana's insights, actually, about ethics. Uh, I was working with a person who turned out to be my colleague, John Locks. Of course, at that time, I was just his student. Uh, and, uh, and that sort of got me uh, interested in some of those figures, uh, and uh, I was directed to that way. And then uh, when I went on to uh, uh, Virginia, Virginia was a very staunchly analytic program. It was not, uh, it wasn't a lot of holistic thinking. It was analytic philosophy. And uh, so I didn't get back around to that stuff really until a bit later in my life. I, I wrote a dissertation on Quine. Uh, I, uh, I struggled with Wittgenstein. My first reading of Wittgenstein was as a graduate student, I mean an undergraduate in a senior seminar. And I really came to believe that my capacity to, uh, to understand philosophy and to do anything with philosophy had come to an end. Uh, I'd had the same experience in math you know, it came a point where I just couldn't do the math anymore. And I thought, oh my God, this is terrible because I, I was thinking about this as a thing to do. And then I, I just couldn't wrap my mind around uh, Wittgenstein. Uh, but uh, fortunately, I, I, got, I kept at it and lo and behold. Um, so uh, in the meantime, though, I was reading... Uh, thinking about various American figures because I saw in them, uh, 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 from a different kind of perspective, similar uh, views uh, to, to some of the things that I saw in Wittgenstein. Uh, uh, I was uh, uh, talking today about uh, uh, Hillary Putnam and, and Putnam's essay, a very interesting essay, uh, Realism with a Human Face, um, uh, and it, it has, uh, you know, he's struggling with a question that, that uh, the Tractatus proposes, this whole question of, uh, of philosophy wanting to say what can't be said. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it was those kind, I mean, he doesn't come at it by, in Wittgensteinian ways, but he comes at that problem, and the more you think about it, the more you realize that uh, he's, uh, that's, a, that's a problem that, that they're both struggling with in their own way. And so I thought of American philosophy as a kind of bridge between Wittgenstein on the one side and, to some extent, continental thinkers on the other uh, who struggle with some of these same issues. Uh, but I've never... Uh, I've always, when somebody tells me that uh, that Wittgenstein and Derrida say the same thing, I say, "Boy, I'm glad to hear that because I understand Wittgenstein, but I don't understand Derrida." <laughs> so, so these um, various attempts to say what's not sayable or say what's at the limits of what's sayable, um, part of the pragmatist tradition is in terms of reconstructing our language to be able to come to terms with some of that. 
and in particular, you've been working with the pragmatist reconstruction and philosophy of religion. Um, right. So tell me about how this, how that reconstructive program works, and how that lines up with um, that larger aspiration of mm. saying something really big. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, uh, my uh, the, the interest I have in religion is in part due to the fact that there are a lot of people who take religion seriously. Uh, and uh, and who uh, are, are live lives in accord with what they take religion to, to be saying, and they take it seriously, and they uh, it's important to them, and so on. And so it seems to me, um, uh, to put it uh, straightforwardly, that that it can't just be a lot of epistemological nonsense. There's got to be some way of understanding uh, that. Uh, that gives it sense or, or well, makes it uh, sensible and doesn't uh, commit us to believing uh, all sorts of nonsensical things that we wouldn't believe in any other context. Uh, uh, so that's sort of the premise upon which I begin. And then there's material in uh, uh, some of Wittgenstein's lesser known works, you know, culture and value, value. and uh, electro and ethics and, and other things, where he makes uh, uh, statements along these lines. Uh, uh, he says, for example, uh, uh, the, the terror and pain of hell can be felt in one day. Well, that seems to suggest, for example, that he's not thinking about hell as a eschatological destination, but as a state of being, as a state of human existence. And, uh, and so if you start to reconstruct the texts and the writings and so on in those ways, uh, you it opens out uh, to an interesting, maybe if that's you're inclined in that direction, an interesting way of taking stuff that doesn't commit you to bad metaphysics or uh, uh, historical nonsense. So another program that you've seen as in this reconstructive program is ethics. So uh, avoiding the bad metaphysics of ethics. And a lot of this seem your work has been inspired by and in response to William James's Moral Philosopher and the Moral Life. Lately, uh, that's right. So tell us, tell us a little bit about that. Okay, well, uh, one of the things I like about James is that uh, James uh, uh, is uh, a naturalist uh, in the sense that he thinks that values arise uh, uh, out of, in relation to uh, human desire, human purpose, human need, uh, and that, that uh, the, there's no sort of transcendent moral order, uh, there's no... Uh, uh, as he puts it, uh, no starry heavens above or moral law within, uh, clearly uh, rejecting a kind of uh, Kantian approach. Uh, and, and he tries, uh, uh, successfully or not, he tries to build up uh, a, a complicated ethical position, starting off with uh, a single conscious individual uh, who has desires and needs and who, who has to order those desires and needs in order to achieve any kind of satisfaction. And then he sort of keeps adding uh, people on and raising questions and, uh, and we go down the, uh, the line. And, and there are places where obviously it becomes uh, complicated. And, uh, and you very well know some of that because you've raised some of those complications. Uh, but uh, sympathetically, of course. Oh, of course, <laughs> uh, of course, right. Um, uh, and I have, in my, I've been thinking lately of trying to respond to some of those as I as I keep uh, keep going here. Uh, this partly arises out of the fact that I have to give a presidential address uh, at the for the William James Society. Well, congratulations on the presidency. Uh, well, that's been for a while now. Okay. And of course, because of the pandemic, uh, nothing really has been happening. We haven't meet, been meeting or 
um, much of anything. Uh, and I suppose, and I can't find out when I'm supposed to do this, but I know it's in the future, right? And so, unless it's in the far distant future, in which case I won't worry about it, uh, I'm, I've been thinking and writing some stuff and preparing for that. One, it, one issue, now let me just give you one example of an issue. Uh, it, it seems complicated or, or impossible, perhaps, to adjudicate between two desires, which on their face, uh, just uh, oppose each other. Um, the desire of uh, a gay person to, uh, to uh, live a gay lifestyle and the desire of a uh, evangelical Christian not to have people like that in his or her world. Um, these are two desires. How, would you, how could you prefer one over the other? Uh, why? And so on. It, lo it looks like James is at loggerheads here, just stuck. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that's true. So long as you think about the set of values to be worked on or, or developed into a, 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 an ideal set as static. Uh, but if you think of that um, set of values or set of goods in a dynamic way, in a way that's changing uh, and that we are engaged in the business of changing it in particular ways, then, then new kinds of information become relevant. What sorts of desires are, for example, uh, uh, contingent? Which, what desires are likely to go away and which ones are not likely to go away over time? What role would education have? In other words, I think that the thing that, that James misses uh, and that his uh, follower, Dewey, uh, is famous for is a theory of education and a theory of education as itself a moral tool, um, so that we have to think of the, of the ideal of the moral philosopher as something that is open-ended over time. It doesn't start with this set of goods and stop with this set of goods. Uh, James says at the very beginning that ethics can't be settled until the last person has had his or her, his or her say, and that's going to be a while. Uh, we'll keep going. Um, but so you've also done some work on deep disagreement, taking this model of moral disagreement and not just theorizing it, but finding ways to manage it, finding ways to sort of break the loggerhead. Um, tell us how this works with deep disagreement. Okay, well, I'm not always sure what, uh, what kind of disagreements count as deep disagreements, right? Uh, Great question. Uh, uh, some, uh, I'll, I'll give you a simple example here. Uh, one of the things that's changed the most in my lifetime as far as ethics goes is the, uh, you might say, the ethics of extra or premarital sex. When I was a young person, this was a, uh, 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 like the third rail. I mean, uh, if, if you touch this rail, particularly if women touched this rail, uh, it was death. Uh, I knew many young women who, uh, whose fathers wouldn't talk to them for two years uh, after the, these circumstances. And today, it's nothing, right? I mean, it's, a, uh, it's just simply not an issue, uh, except perhaps in some small uh, corners of, of the world. Um, so that, I mean, there, there was a deep disagreement, I suppose, that resolved itself in practice uh, somehow. I'm, just, I'm not, I mean, I'm not a sociologist, and so I'm not clear about exactly what changed there, but we all know that there's an immense change. My, my wife, who is a lawyer and a, and a judge, uh, marries people occasionally, and often there are two or three kids around when they get married. It's, well, you know, we've had a third kid, maybe it's time to get married. Uh, there's no moral issue about it. It's just a convenience matter. Uh, that's a huge change, and that, that overcame what looked like an ir irreconcilable problem. Uh, now, on, a, on the other side of that, there's the abortion issue. Uh, that, there's a, obviously a deep disagreement, right, where, where you have on the one side 
concerns about a, a, a living human being, and on the other side, concerns about uh, the integrity and uh, freedom of, uh, of the person carrying that living human being, right? And there's, that's where the debate lies. And it's not clear how, how you would resolve that or how, even how you would set about resolving it. Um, but I, I, I'm interested in, uh, I wrote a paper with a colleague of mine uh, who also was a student of mine, Thomas Crocker, who is now a distinguished professor of law at South Carolina, uh, on uh, uh, checks and balances. Uh, there are a number of legal theorists who think that checks and balances are all talk and no, uh, no go, that, uh, that when the, uh, when the uh, executive uh, claims that there's some crisis and acts, that, uh, that overrides everything. Uh, it's sort of the old Nixon line, if the president does it, it's not illegal. Um, we argued that, that, that that's clearly not the case, uh, and the example that we, uh, we talked about, uh, Wittgenstein's discussion of rules and rule following and the way rules come to have meaning by being embedded in the practices uh, of the people, this is what we do, uh, and, uh, and then we used as an example of that uh, Roosevelt and the internment of, of Japanese Americans which he got away with, but uh, we all agree now was immoral, was wrong, was uh, not uh, what was called for by the uh, uh, emergency situation. So there was an independent judgment that judged this emergency action. Uh, so uh, there's, and, and, and the way that came through was in terms of what our practices were, what, what we mean by uh, respecting individuals and, and so on. So you embed that in the in human practice. Uh, that, by the way, brings in somebody like Richard Rorty, uh, who, who also is, plays between the, 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 the sort of American tradition and Wittgensteinian tradition and Dewey. Uh, he's, he says that his three heroes are Heidegger, Dewey, and Wittgenstein. I don't know anything about Heidegger, but I'm glad to hear about Dewey and Wittgenstein. So there you go. Uh, so uh, one other face of the this, uh, and in fact, one of the other difficulties that we see with long-standing, deep disagreements is that one's tempted by skepticism in these cases. Uh, one's tempted by skepticism in being able to sort of completely answer all of these challenges. And so you're also doing some work on um, certain kinds of reconstructive programs in, uh, with regard to skepticism, particularly with uh, George Santayana's Skepticism and Animal Faith. Um, can you tell us about that, that program? Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, let me just, about, about the reconstructive part of it, um, I see uh, Santayana's skepticism, which is not a positive view, it, it's, an, it's a completely negative view. What it tries to show is that a certain model of what knowledge is, uh, is totally empty. That if you press all the way down, you are really reduced to silence. There are, no judgment can meet the standard that, uh, that is being suggested. It's an empty standard. And so what Zaniana takes from that is uh, that we need to think uh, uh, through a, a, a new standard. And for him, uh, he, he says the standard he wants is what he calls animal faith. It is uh, the judgments that are forced upon us uh, by our actions. We, we take it uh, that there's a cup to be picked up here that there's a, uh, a room that we're sitting in and that if we left the room, the room would still be here. We, we assume that uh, the ball that rolls behind the door <clears throat> is behind the door to be found. Uh, we, there's a kind of, if you want, uh, a realism uh, that's just implicit in our actions. And uh, I, I find 
uh, in uh, in Wittgenstein something of the same sort. He he, he often refers to animal. <coughs> he says uh, <coughs> he says, for example, uh, any logic that is good enough for a squirrel is good enough for me. Uh, I don't think I, I'm not claiming that's a quote, but it's close. Uh, uh, you know, he says, does it does the squirrel uh, infer that the uh, that, that the nuts will be there in the fall. Um, uh, you know, that, and the, the, he appeals to a certain <coughs> uh, human, I would call it, form of life. Uh, he, uh, he, one of his famous examples uh, is, is the smile on the face of an unmoon child uh, pretense. Right? No, <laughs> the, the, the space of, of that possibility just isn't there, right? I mean, that's one of the, <clears throat> that's a natural response to, to satisfaction or to uh, well-being and so on. We, it, it, there's no room for skepticism at that point. Um, so skepticism undercuts itself, and uh, uh, I, actually my colleague Lox and I wrote, wrote a book on uh, Sadian and Wittgenstein, uh, uh, about that, which, by the way, was actually mentioned in the, in the New York Times book review section. Oh, right! I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. it was, <laughs> Making the big tab. <laughs> it was only mentioned kind of down here in the sidebar. Okay. Oh, yeah, you might think this was interesting. And yeah, that was the end yeah, of that. That's great. Yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> so, uh, let's turn to talking about some of your teaching. So, we... You teach um, a class in American philosophy. I do. Uh, tell us a little bit about what that class looks like. Okay. Well, I uh, uh, I start out <clears throat> with um, Emerson. I read three essays by <clears throat> Emerson, um, uh, Self-Reliance, uh, The American Scholar, and Friendship. Um, and I try to, uh, to situate... Uh, some uh, uh, to use that to situate some later things. I read uh, Dewey and Hook uh, on uh, on democracy and on this sort of respect for the individual, uh, and and I I take that back to Emerson uh, and uh, the idea that individuals uh, are each see the world uh, from, uh, from a slightly different perspective, and therefore, if they don't give voice to what they see. Nobody can give voice to it. Um, that, so that's part of it. Uh, I, I do, uh, I jump up to uh, Peirce and James. Uh, uh, I, uh, I do, I add to, to uh, the collection that you and, uh, and Talise have, I add the more flux for the more life because uh, I think that's important. Uh, I interpose after that, uh, uh, Samsoniana, who is not a pragmatist, but has a great affinity for pragmatists and right and was at Harvard right in the middle of this blooming of, you know, Peirce, well, Peirce wasn't at Harvard, but James, uh, Dewey, uh, Royce was there. I mean, it, it was a, uh, it was a hell of a time, uh, obviously, a lot going on. Um, then I, you know, I come on into the uh, more contemporary stuff. We, we read uh, uh, C.I. Lewis. Uh, I, I have tried to read uh, uh, some Carnap, some Goodman, some Quine. Uh, I, I, have, I have found it an immense struggle at the undergraduate level to try uh, to work with that stuff, and it, and it's ultimately not very productive for undergraduates. They don't have the background, really, to to appreciate what it is, the, what problems uh, they're de that are being dealt with in some of those essays. So this time I'm skipping over uh, Quine, uh, and uh, I'm going to read uh, Putnam on uh, um, uh, realism with a. Uh, Human face, um, which, as I mentioned earlier, I think bears some affinities with the sable and the unsable, 
in the in Wittgenstein in a you know interesting way. Uh, I have I always tell a story, a, a, a Monty Python story, that Python, where Pythons uh, uh, they have two people in the jungle, and they're with pith helmets and the whole bit, and they're lost in the jungle, and the young woman is, oh my God, we're lost, we're going to die in the jungle, we're going to die, and the guy looks very concerned and uh, at her and uh, she says well we'll never find our way out we're lost and, and uh, he says all of a sudden wait a minute this is being filmed if it's being filmed there's got to be a film crew around here somewhere and so pan back and there's the, there's the <laughs> film crew and there they are and they greet each other and kiss and hug and it's all wonderful and good and then somebody says wait a minute this is being filmed and so you draw back and there's another camera and so on. And you see that this can go on forever and that there's no camera that can capture the whole story, right? There's always a camera that can't be put on camera. Uh, and that's part of what, what's involved in the, in the uh, Putnam's early discussion of quantum mechanics on the one hand and, and, uh, uh, and self-referential -refer problems in logic on the other hand. But from, from a student's point of view, the Monty Python really puts that point over. I think that, oh, wow, that's funny, and, and, uh, and so on. So, uh, uh, so after that, we will do um, um, his, his essay on Dewey's uh, democracy, picking back up on some political theory stuff. Uh, we'll do Rorty uh, on the priority prior of democracy to philosophy. Uh, we'll uh, do uh, that essay by uh, uh, Cornell West on uh, religion. Uh, it kind of takes up something of this kind of attempt to reconstruct. Uh, I think that that essay uh, suffers the problems that, uh, uh, that Putnam points out. That is, it, it, it tries to go beyond, it tries to say what it says it can't be said. It tries to turn history into a piece of metaphysics. Uh, uh, by saying the, the truth about religion is that it's historicized. And, uh, and so it seems to appeal to the truth, denying that you can appeal to the truth because everything is historical. That You can see that's kind of a self-contradictory uh, line. That's going to have some self-undercutting problems. So uh, speaking of the, 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 the West piece on religion, you also teach another class on philosophy of religion. Uh, tell us about the broad contours of that class. Well, okay, I, uh, that class, I, what I try to do is int introduce the main issues uh, uh, that are sort of define the standard philosophy of religion uh, enterprise. Uh, we start off with uh, asking about uh, what, uh, what God uh, is or would be if God existed. What is the nature of God? Uh, how would what are there any methods for determining that? Uh, is it just arbitrary, uh, uh, and so on? We read ver various uh, people on that, from from sort of poets uh, to, to to formalists. Uh, Morris, for example, a very famous guy, uh, uh, has a kind of. Uh, Anselmian view. God is that then which none greater can be conceived. Uh, it, what's interesting, of course, about his actual articulation of that view is that all the properties that are certain, that are great making properties, turn out to be human properties. Is a kind of. A, we made him uh, in our image. That's amazing. Well, <laughs> uh, an odd outcome. An odd outcome, right? Uh, the, anyway, then we go on to uh, the traditional proofs, uh, the problem of evil as the main uh, anti. Uh, argument. Uh, uh, well, if you if if you can't get formal proofs, what about the practical proofs? Uh, Pascal, uh, James, uh, uh, on on the uh, on that topic. Uh, Kierkegaard, uh, you know, uh, it's truth is subjectivity. What does that mean? Uh, and that I uh, I tend to interpret that along the Wittgensteinian lines. Uh, now, I think there's some affinity between Wittgenstein and, and Samyama. I mean, Wittgenstein and uh, Kierkegaard. Right, sorry, slipping the tongue. Uh, and then we look into some problems about the relationship between 
science and scientific truth and religious truth, if there is. Uh, we look into the question of pluralism. Uh, what can we say about uh, the fact that there are multiple religions? Uh, can they all be true? Uh, if mine is true, is yours false? Uh, how, how do we deal with that? What's the relationship between morality and, and religion? Uh, and we go back to, uh, to the euthyphro on, on that. And, and uh, What makes the pious pious? The gods love, or do the gods love the pious because it's pious? Absolutely. You, a, put your, that is you put your finger deep on it. deep version of that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we push back. that through. That's right. That's and right. I, I think that's an important uh, a thing because lots of students, at least, believe there's some kind of connection between be, the being of God and, and uh, absolute. What's that connection? Uh, that's exactly right. What's what is that connection? That connection? So, um, and then the other class that you teach uh, at the undergraduate level is the philosophy and literature class. Philosophy and literature. It's and instead of of. You better uh, believe that. And so tell me about how, so tell me first off, what's the difference between philosophy and literature and philosophy of literature, first question, and then tell me a little bit about how that class works. Okay. Well, philosophy of literature is, I guess, the questions about what literature is, uh, how, uh, if it does, how literature conveys uh, truth, what, uh, what's the role of, of symbols. I, I mean, there are a whole host of questions, many of which I don't even know about. Uh, so I, I just uh, stay as far away from that as I can <laughs> because I'm, I'm sure that I'm ignorant on the subject. So what I'm really interested in is the way that philosophy, philosophical issues and ideas, are conveyed in particular pieces of literature that I find interesting. Uh, I mean, that's it. You know, I pick I pick a collection of, of uh, essays, or I'm sorry, not, not essays, but a collection of uh, uh, of fiction, and then I pair the the fiction with something philosophical. So let me give you a simple example uh, of Mice and Men, that famous. Uh, uh, Steinbeck piece, which I like partly because I grew up in and around uh, uh, the Salinas Valley. In Steinbeck, California. Steinbeck land. Steinbeck country. That's, <laughs> that's right. right. That's right. <laughs> you can go up to Salinas and go to Steinbeck's house, or you can go to the Lettuce Inn. That's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> that's what passes for a joke in philosophy. Hey, man. Standards, standards are low for jokes, high for arguments. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, uh, that's a story about two men who uh, are friends, who are uh, committed to each other, uh, struggling uh, with, with the depression and uh, traveling around. And one of them is a, 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 absolute, a, a, a challenged person. He's not too bright, uh, but he's hardworking, he's loving, uh, he, he's caring for his uh, friend. Uh, and, uh, and, well, everybody knows the story. He, he likes to touch things and feel them and, and, and so on. And he finally uh, kills a woman, uh, not by any kind of sexual attack, but simply because uh, he gets, he's touching her hair. Uh, and she moves, and he, he's so strong, he just breaks her neck. Uh, but, of course, uh, People are not going to understand that at all. He's not of this world in that sense, and and so what? A, in the end, what happens is that his friend uh, shoots him because he's about to be caught by a, a gang of uh, vigilantes who are going to beat him and and kill him, and uh, but not at not before they malign him and and uh, are cruel to him and so on, and so there's no escape. Um, so. It's, an, it's a friendship where the, one of the friends kills the other friend. What, that just raises questions. So I go off and read uh, philosophically. I read uh, Aristotle on friendship, right? Uh, the, probably the, the most famous discussion of friendship. Uh, and I read uh, Emerson's essay on friendship, which I also read in another context. And, and I sort of ask this question, uh, would these 
two men be counted as friends given Aristotle's account of friendship and Emerson's account of friendship? If so, why? And if not, why not? And what does that say about Emerson, um, Emerson and Aristotle? Are they wrong about friendship then? In other words, we can sort of test out the, this, this theory or these theories by putting forward uh, a clear example. Uh, so that's one uh, I read. Uh, uh, I don't need to go through the whole class. I, I, I also read uh, 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 Kate Chopin's uh, piece title of which will come to me in a blazing flash. Uh, well, it's not coming to me. It, 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 but it's a, uh, it's a brilliant study. It's about a woman uh, uh, coming, coming to awareness uh, of wh who she is and what she is and, and uh, stretching her arms and finding herself limited on all sides. And uh, so that brings in feminist themes from feminist literature. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I read uh, uh, an essay by who used to be our, uh, one of our colleagues. Uh, now, what's her name? Our colleague who, who had to retire, female. Kelly Oliver? No, no. Kelly hasn't retired. Oh, uh, Marilyn, <coughs> Marilyn Friedman. Marilyn Friedman. Got it. <coughs> she writes an essay on friendship, uh, in, in, not friendship, well, I read it in, the, in relation to, uh, uh, to being, uh, uh, it's coming alive, it's, that, that's the name of the, anyway, it doesn't make any difference. Um, about uh, friendship as in, as, as, enlarging who you are and making, giving you possibilities of seeing how other people see things in ways you might never do. <clears throat> and I actually, do, or I think that's perfectly correct, but I think that our friends are too much like us most of the time and that, <laughs> and that literature may be better at that. Uh, so, uh, and then, you know, I've tried to read uh, Sartre some of Sartre's plays and talk about existentialism. Uh, I just find that Sartre is so didactic that it's uh, <laughs> I just... I, you know. His plays come across as arguments. Yeah, they sure do. <laughs> sure do. They're, they're, they're Nausea all, feels that way, too. They're <laughs> almost as bad as... Uh, as uh, Seneca's plays that are that way. Also. Well, that may yeah. be right. I was thinking of, of Ayn Rand. Oh, well... <laughs> I say they're almost as bad as that. <laughs> well, Seneca's a better writer, at least. Ah. Uh, well, so, uh, Professor Hodges, thanks so much for telling us about the, your, your arc into this. From, from avoiding Saturday morning uh, <laughs> quizzes now to a career teaching and, know, uh, teaching and writing philosophy. Uh, it's an amazing uh, path, uh, a really productive path. You've had many students that really appreciated your work and your, and your, and your teaching. Thanks for your time with us today. I had a good time. Wonderful. Thanks. Great. All right.